All right. I'm so still working on some ice cream. <laughs> it's 8.01. So we'll start. How is everybody? It seems to be all right, dear. We all seem to be pretty well. Good. May, may the divine being smile on us. May we smile back. May our hearts be clear and pure so that the reflection of the divine is clear and pure in us. May we be pleased to be alive. May we be pleased that we have our divine companions and our human companions. May our hearts go out to all humanity in their suffering and their joy. Om Amen. So Heidi, would you like to read this Two Drunk Beauties? Oh, I would love to read it. <laughs> yeah, this is the one, the poem that uh, is on the front of her bio. Right. <laughs> Two Drunk Beauties. The moon was perched like a golden hawk on the mango tree. I knew the moon was like me in heat praised and hunting. So I climbed up there with that wild old gal thinking, two drunk beauties like us will surely snag Krishna with our eyes. Two drunk beauties. The moon was perched like a golden hawk on the mango tree. I knew the moon was like me, in heat, crazed, and hunting. So I climbed up there with that wild old gal, thinking, two drunk beauties like us will surely snag Krishna with our eyes. <laughs> That's Mirabai all the way. <laughs> I just, I love the way she characterizes the moon like a golden hawk. I do too. That, yeah. The image, of course, that I think she means for us to bring to mind is the waning moon, uh, the, the curved last portion of, of, of the moon before the moon goes uh, into new moon or dark, you know, uh, 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 the the, uh, the the crescent moon that of of this of the of the new moon is at the bottom, but of the uh, at the uh, the waning, it's curved at the top, so it's like a like a hawk bent over. That's how I saw that wonderful image, like a golden hawk. And of course, you know, so I climbed up there with that wild old gal thinking two drunk beauties like us will surely snag Krishna with our eyes. Anybody else got anything to say about this sweet poem? June, it's good to be able to see you. You've got your screen and all tilted in such a way that we can actually see your face. It's good. Hey. Yeah. Anybody else out there got anything to say about this poem? 
Okay. Use the geometry. He left his fingerprint on a glass the earth drinks from. Every religion has studied it. Churches and temples use the geometry of those lines to establish rites and laws and prayers and our ideas of the universe. I guess there is just no telling how out of hand and wonderfully wild things will get when our lips catch up to his. Use the geometry. He left his fingerprint on a glass the earth drinks from. Every religion has studied it. Churches and temples use the geometry of those lines to establish rites and laws and prayers and our ideas of the universe. I guess there's just no telling how out of hand and wonderfully wild things will get when our lips catch up to his. When we go from the fingerprint and the ideas of universe to meeting face to face and actually having a kissing relationship with the divine. You know, she talks about all of the, all of this, all of the secondary details that we're so good at uh, creating, we human beings, churches and temples, rites, laws and prayers and our ideas of the universe. All these left mind ideas all these left mind ways of being. I guess there's just no telling how out of hand and wonderfully wild things will get when our lips catch up to his. Anyone else have anything to say about this lovely and very, I believe, profound poem? So what does that first sentence, his left, he left his fingerprint on a glass the earth drinks from, what does that, what does that mean? Well, you know, or what do you think what's, it means? what's so often said here, Heidi, uh, each of us will have our own meaning for that. But he left, he left, the, the Lord left his imprint on that which we take from the earth and and everything on it takes from um and that that fingerprint of course that's an interesting if we think about a fingerprint a fingerprint a is unique there's no two fingerprints alike so this is a unique representation of, of the Lord. It's it's a metaphor, it seems to me, for that which we can conceptualize from the evidence that we see of the Lord's presence in the universe. 
but that isn't at all what Mirabai is interested in. She's interested in that intimate, personal, madly in love relationship with the divine person. And of course, that's not restricted to her or to her faith tradition. Oh, it's, it's there in the Sufis. It's there in the Catholics. Definitely many of the Catholic saints there's, will, encounter, will encounter it more as we go through, particularly the female ones, have this relationship that goes beyond idea or beyond geometry, as she said. That's my idea, Heidi. What do you think it means? Well, I didn't quite understand it, um, honestly, is why I was asking. Okay. Well, that's my understanding. Okay. I mean, I was thinking like the glasses of, I don't know, the ocean, you know, kind of like the big, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't sure what, you know, I was kind of. Do you think it could mean the cross? No, I don't think so, dear, because uh, this was, Mirabai wasn't at all familiar with the cross or, uh, or Christianity. Uh, though there is, uh, there are crosses in many other religions, they don't uh, have the same significance that the cross has for, for Christians. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. I, uh, the way I read it is the fingerprints that he left are the clues that uh, religions are studying and kind of finding, um, reaching, finding the, the what he left the clues about. But right now it's limited because of our limited vision. Just And so we use those lines just for rites and laws and prayers and making our own ideas to a point. But then when we actually realize, I guess she's telling that it's just going to be beyond imagination. So he's left some clues to help us find him. I, I like that very much. And that had utterly escaped me. Fingerprint on a glass, of course, is a classic uh, detective's clue. You know, aha. We found a fingerprint on the glass. There's a there's a clue. I very good, Swayam. Very good. From from here, that just that uh, that that adds up perfectly. Anyone else have anything to say? Thank you, Swayam, for chipping in. Hello, Frank. And there's Brahmadas and Katrina. And who else just joined us? Tis I. Oh, hello there, Sharda Cindy. Hey. Okay. Well, maybe we can get you to read the next poem, which is on page, it looks like 254. Is that right? Somebody who has the book 254? Heidi is, is yes, that, that is correct. Um, yeah. Okay, so Cindy, could you read? Is this is all this God stuff real? <laughs> sure. Is all this God stuff real? Girls think twice before inviting God near. His charms will turn you into a slave. Are you ready for such a wonderful bondage? What if your human lover is just about ready to insert a pulsating mass into your forest and reign there? What if he ju what if just as he, she enters, you hear his flute calling? Could you run outside in a second 
naked and ready for the world to make fun of you? For who can really see him? Everyone may think you are worshiping a mirage. And what if he asked you to give all your gold bangles and the fine cloths to the next beggar you see? Giving him our clay, our body, to shape is one thing, for this can excite us. But when our jewelry and silk are at risk, surely it is time to seriously ask, is all this God stuff real? <laughs> I'll read it again. Is all this God stuff real? Girls, think twice before inviting God near. His charms will turn you into a slave. Are you ready for such a wonderful bondage? What if your human lover is just about to insert a pulsating mass into your forest and reign there? What if just as he, she enters, you hear his flute calling? Could you run outside in a second, naked and ready for the world to make fun of you? For, for who can really see him? Everyone may think you are worshiping a mirage. And what if he asked you to give all your gold bangles and fine cloths to the next beggar you see? Giving him our clay, our body, to shape is one thing, for this can excite us. But when our jewelry and silk are at risk, surely it is time to seriously ask, is all this God stuff real? I, I can't help but think she's just being silly <laughs> because I don't think Mirabai really thinks that last part, you know, if all my nice stuff is at risk, then maybe we should ask. I don't know. I don't know her. <laughs> um, well, this this poem is about renunciation. Yeah, right. This poem is about what are you willing to give up if you really believe in in God and and you really form a relationship with God that you give up all the best worldly stuff that most people supposedly and and your sense of shame are you ready to run naked outside uh have the world make fun of you frank were you saying something i said i wouldn't have the heart to do that to the people <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's a different matter <laughs> but you know, I the, the the title of this poem is a question that runs through my mind um, more often than I'm comfortable with. And um, I had decided when I was listening to the poem <laughs> that I want an experience like Arjuna. That's that's what I want. I want I want Krishna or whoever it is in front of me. I want an experience like Arjuna. Because my problem is, I don't know if I believe all this God stuff is real. So to give things up or to completely give into it, um, for me, is very scary to think that I'm doing that for something that may not even be real. So for me, what, what stops me is that doubt. So that's what I go through. Understood. And from those people who've been on both sides, what they tell you is the only way to find out if it's real is to take the plunge. And and uh, and of course, uh, if you sincerely want, and I'm not doubting your sincerity, I'm just saying, since you sincerely want 
a an encounter like Arjuna's with the divine presence. That is what you should pray for day in and day out. At least that's my understanding from everything I've ever been taught. Just make that your only prayer. See, I, I have a concern with that coming from uh, the Christian background. Um, I was almost taught that who am I to ask anything of God? Or who am I to say to God? Because when you said that, it sounded beautiful for a moment of God, please reveal yourself to me, show yourself to me. And then this thought came in, well, who the hell am I to ask such a thing of God? And with the Christian background, which I don't want to go back to that, but questioning God or anything like that, I was almost trained that that was evil or negative or bad. So is, is that a wrong teaching? Is it okay to ask God to reveal itself? Well, certainly Arjuna does. Arjuna does on practically every page say, you know, tell me the truth. Tell me, tell me who you really are. Show me who you really are. Show me your, your divine form. He can't stand it when he gets what he asks for. <laughs> but, uh, and also, if you want to talk about the, the Christian or Catholic way, St. Teresa of Avila has a great revelation in the streets of Rome one night when she's feeling depressed. And she encounters an old monk. She just, he just passes by. He doesn't pay any attention to her and he's not speaking to her. But he's, what he's saying is, please God, tell me everything you know. And he's repeating it over and over. Please God, tell me everything you know. And she finds this a great uh, revelation and relief from the state that she's in. That's another one of the poems that's in this book. So is this God's, is all this God's stuff real? Well, I, th it's I think it's perfectly appropriate to, to ask. As a matter of fact, Sri Ramakrishna insists that you must ask, and you must ask as a petulant child, banging your fist on the table. He calls it tamasic bhakti, tamasic devotion. Somebody else was going to say something. I, I was starting to pipe up um, a little bit. I think you know, for a lot of us, and I'm included, that, you know, if you get to live long enough, this is a lifelong question that won't be asked and asked and asked, and then suddenly you get what you've asked for, and then you never ask that question again. At least I haven't found that. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of these saints that we're reading in this book didn't live that long. You know, not compared to how long most of us are, are living or are going to live. And, but a lot of, you know, mystic type people that we know about who have lived a long time or not, you know, they have not just one crisis of faith but they have multiple ones and the longer you live and the more you experience especially living in a world as we are right now that's changing so rapidly it's it's it would almost mean that we're asleep if we're not questioning i mean i think it's awesome for anybody that 
gets what they're asking for, that presence and that vision, and they never again lose it. They never need to go looking for it again. I'm not that person, but I do. I mean, I have at times just felt completely like the divine was just right here. Just, hey, how you doing? Thanks for being here. But sometimes I'm like, I don't know. And, and I will say, are you real? I mean, what is this? Tell me. You don't have to tell me right now. Tell me later if you want to. But you know, <laughs> it's, it's important for me to be able to talk. If there's a divine being, and if I have that divinity within me, I have to be able to talk to that divine being, that divine presence like I would talk to my best friend. So I do, but that's, you know, anyway, I just wanted to say that I, I think that it's, it's a perfectly human question and to be asked and asked and uh, you'll get different things at different times. And some of those answers will satisfy and stay for a while, but you may have to ask it again. I think that's very, very true. You want to you want to expand on that, June? Well, it, it it's been that way with me. I've I've had life come at me with such crescendo sometimes that I say, where, where are you, God? Now, as I've gotten older and I'm not facing too many life crises, It's, um, it's just like the 23rd Psalm says. You walk in green pastures, you walk by still waters. And God restores your soul. Yes. And uh, Frank, if you want to uh, look at this from a Judeo-Christian point of view, read some of David's Psalms. The 23rd, of course, is one. But there's others where he is just banging his head against the wall and saying, is all this God stuff real? So it's absolutely not uh, inappropriate in the least. And <laughs> as I said, if you look at the Gita, Arjuna, is asking Krishna to tell him the truth and straighten him out and uh, reveal himself throughout the Gita. So, another Catholic saint, Saint Catherine of Siena has a very moving poem about being unable to get out of bed and dress herself. She's so, she's so depressed and uncertain. So as Cindy points out, even these great ones and she was in, undoubtedly a great one and did not live very long, but even so, she had her moments. 
And thank you, June, for being so sweet and honest with us about how things have been for you and how as you've gotten older, things have simplified and become more like the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I walk here now. Thou art with me. My rod and thy staff, they, they comfort me. And, and that too is there. Anything else from anyone? This is a long and... and uh, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So um, when I have the doubts, what I find helpful is, again, um, to stake that that faith in in the scriptures and the saints and the avatars you know they may have had their moments of doubt but when they say they saw god i just take a lot of um, confidence that i too will get there one day that's one and the other thing is what i sometimes it doesn't happen all the time but um, instead of waiting for God to present himself or herself as a friend, I see the friend who has helped me in a, in a moment of crisis as God or a child who has brought laughter to my eyes as God oh. and try to convert it that way. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I, this point reminds me of uh, the story you told about the, uh, Kennedy and where he was having challenges and then had to uh, went to one of the Swamis and the Swami told him to give up, give up a lot of his wealth. And, and it reminds me also of the, of the part in the Bible that says it's, it's easier for a, um, it, well, it's more challenging for a rich man to get through, get to the kingdom, then the a camel, then an the eye's needle, and a you know, and the, yeah, and the eye's needle. And also, when Jesus says, "Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you," it, it, I, I think we we the God, and that's the term that I use. It's really a big unknown, and you really have to, I, for myself, really had to just make a commitment to discover the unknown. And that's what this poem reminds me of. Oh, I love what you just said, Katrina, that you have to make a commitment to know the unknown. Yes. And, you know, we'll never know it all. How can we possibly, how can this finite being ever know the infinite? But the way that great knowledge is comes to us is by uniting our inner innermost being our heart of hearts with the divine then there's there's no limitations but that that is that is a uh, that is a gift as uh, that happens, as Jesus said, ye have not chosen me, I have chosen you to have this kind of experience. But it, it, the, the word that you used, uh, Katrina, is so perfect, commitment, commitment. That means it's something that you do all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is what all of the great saints ask of us, the avatars, the, the teachers, the incarnations, is that commitment. Jesus doesn't say, come follow me, but look over your shoulder, look back over your shoulder. He says, no, come and follow me. Anything else before we go?
go on to the next poem. Liam, do you have the book open there? Uh, yes, I do. And, uh, Would you like to read this next one? Is the, the next one is The Earth, My Own Body I Explored. You're right. OK, great. Yeah, just one thing before I start this, uh, and that what uh, Katrina just said about commitment is like, you know, what came to my mind was that, you know, there's there's no days off on this uh, path, right? <laughs> well, there's no days off in the ideal, but the humanity of us means that we will step off. You know, we call it a call it a, a, a razor's edge or a tightrope or whatever it is. We will step off. You know, we will take a little side road, a little detour. Uh, and uh, uh, as Swami Vivekananda said, Swami, our great saint Swami Vivekananda said, you fall a thousand times, you rise a thousand and one times. But ideally, there's no day off. You're right. It's it's not it's not a, a five day a week religion. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, yeah, I, I, it was kind of like broad, but like, yeah, just like, yeah, even when we do, or like when I fall off, it's like I know that, I, you know, there there was a lesson to learn for for uh, falling off, and and through that, I, I get back on and yeah, rise again, even on a higher. Uh, level so it, it is you know it, yeah but it isn't like I mean for me it's like once I decided to start exploring there was this no real turning back, back even though yeah I'm not always on the beam or you know focused or even you know <laughs> feeling feeling like it I just always find my way back on it well you know Liam it's interesting you say that because what one finds is that this spiritual life adventure is actually more interesting and more compelling than anything else we can do. And so if we if we take that attitude, well, you know, there are going to be distractions. I'm going to fall off the tightrope or the razor's edge, and I'm going to take a little detour now and then. But when I do, I notice that it isn't as much fun as what I was doing. So we we come back to it. And that's that is really one of the wonders of this is but it requires that commitment. You don't have that that sense of adventure doesn't come until you really committed yourself to it. Absolutely. Thank you. Liam, thank you for being honest about yourself. My pleasure. So, all right. The earth, my own body, I explored. One night, as I walked in the desert, the mountains rode on my shoulders, and the sky became my heart, and the earth, my own body, I explored. Every object began to wink at me, and Mira wisely calculated the situation, thinking my charms must be at their height. Now would be a good time to rush into his arms. Maybe he won't drop me so quick. The earth, my own body, I explored. One night, as I walked in the desert, the mountains rode on my shoulders, and the sky became my heart, and the earth, my own body, I explored. Every object began to wink at me, and Mira wisely calculated the situation, thinking, my charms must be at 
their height. Now would be a good time to rush into his arms. Maybe he won't drop me so quick. Speaking about uh, causes for disappointment and doubt, being dropped so quick, mm. it's hard on us. When the one that we love ardently is fickle. Hmm? But in the case of, you know, God being the, the one you're talking about, God doesn't drop us, we drop ourselves. Uh -huh. Of course. Um. And, you know, as we know about Mirabai, she knows that, she knows better, but she loves this game. Oh, yes. So this is why she is, you know, talks about things in this way. But I know that she knows better. Well, the story is about Mirabai that she encountered in her, I mean, this is in a biography of hers that was read here. It, the story goes, apparently reliably told, that she encountered a saint, a sage, who could offer her liberation. And she said, what? No, I don't want liberation. I want to keep coming back, just like you said. She loved the game, loved this game of hide and seek with the divine. And so she, she said, no, don't give me liberation, please. When I drop this garment, this body, this Mirabai body, I want to come back as someone else who's in love with Krishna. And, and may that go on as long as he wants it to, she said. So June, maybe you will get married again. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs> it could happen. It's a bit funny how like how patient like the divine is and how no matter how sidetracked we get, they're always just there without judgment waiting for us. Aaron so beautifully said, yes. Yes. Yes, and Hafiz has an explanation for it. Each soul, he says, God told him, each soul, each soul completes me. So God is not complete without each of us. And in our evening prayer here, it said, love who art partial to none, we are equal before thy sight. But you're so right, Aaron. This, every one of these saints tells us that God is not just patient, but forgiving beyond our any of our abilities to. I mean, unconditional love is something that we can say in words, but it's the practice of that is Anyway, so what does Mirabai say here? 
one night as I walked in the desert. Now, what is the desert? The desert is a place that is dry and sear and, uh, and but it's free of distractions and so she said the mountains rode on my shoulders and the sky became my heart and the earth my own body i explored so she had a a very strong spiritual experience obviously And uh, this is said in one way or another by every one of these saints, that every object began to wink at me. In other words, the divine was there in every object and, and was saying, here I am, here I am, winking. Every object began to wink at me. And Mira wisely calculated the situation, thinking, my charms must be at their height. <laughs> this is the thing about Mirabai. You know, we're, we're, Mirabai really does think of herself as both non dual and dual. You know, this business of the mountains riding on her shoulder, the sky becoming her heart, the earth became her own body. That's that non-dual experience. But on the other hand, um, then as she's walking along, <laughs> every object began to wink at me. So there's me and those other objects, the divine presence. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So the thought just came to me, just sort of, I don't know, my, uh, if we, since we have been talking about doubt and all that, maybe the desert is the period of doubt, like our mud mind or when we feel so empty hmm. and the mountains are the, the weight of life on the shoulders. At that time, if we become expansive, and think of the sky, like, you know, fill the heart, like with the vastness of the sky, maybe then the stars will start, you know, everything that's around us might appear as the stars winking and we recalculate thinking, you know, we can rush into God's arms. Oh, I, 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 I like your interpretation very much, Swam. Uh, a very nice interpretation of the poem. Very nice. One thing that's interesting to me about this is the second stanza. Um, in the sky became my heart and the earth my own body. Because, you know, like when I think of my, you know, my physical body, it's like our heart is in it right or it's part of it and in that in this metaphor I, I you know i mean i guess you could argue that the sky and the earth are one you know uh part of the same but it, you know it's like this the sky is above the earth mm -hmm. and our physical body our, our heart is in us but you know it's maybe the uh you know i guess what's coming to me is just like the idea you know because i always hear about you know being heart-centered or you know, the heart, you know, like some people I've heard refer to the, you know, Christ consciousness, you know, being the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something about the, like, you know, she, she elevates the heart from the, you know, the rest of this body. You know, with this metaphor, just, I don't know, there's something about that just really. Well, I, I, striking. I, I, I think, I think you're very right. And, uh, uh, the way Swayam was presenting it is this was an antidote to this uh, feeling of being weighed down by the mountains on her shoulders, that, that this expansiveness, this vastness of the sky, that if you feel that in your heart, 
then it's uh, an antidote or relief from this walking in the dry desert that you know and uh, having the and being weighed down by so so many there's always so many ways for us to hear these poems and it has to do with what each of us brings to it and uh, it's, it's splendid one thing that just came to my mind as you were um, sharing what uh, Swayam shared about the, uh, the sky and the desert, uh, it actually gave me really vivid uh, memory just now of um, maybe about 10 years ago, I, I, I was in uh, like Las Vegas. So, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and you, know, you know, Las Vegas is like, and then, but as soon as I, I went to a uh, I think there was a, some sort of observatory, like a, a, a astrological observatory, astronomical, whatever the word is, <laughs> you know, uh, star, you know, stargazing observatory, just not really far, maybe, you know, five, you know, I mean, a couple of miles at, mo at most outside of, you know, the actual city. And mm -hmm. as soon as, you know, as I remember, as soon as I left the, uh, you know, like the actual like development city part and went into the desert, I just remember the sky was just so profound. Like it was just like, it, it, like, it, like, it like came down to me. Yes. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, and a couple of people mentioned about, you know, the desert uh, being kind of like that place of isolation or, you know, doubt. But it's like you know, it's in in the in the desert where the sky becomes so um, profound. So it's like you know, it's sometimes it's like you know, walking through the desert allows us to appreciate the sky more and connect with it more. Uh, kind of gives you an idea why that observatory is there, huh? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. To kind of tie in is like you know those moments when i guess we feel that doubt and feel that disconnect or that solitude or loneliness it you know allows us to see you know the expansiveness of the heart or of, of god or whatever you want to call it a lot more easily like it comes it's easier to see that eventually <laughs> Yes, well, that's that's the way I heard it. I didn't see the desert as as uh, a, a, as a negative place, um, but I can certainly see Swayam's point. My reading of it didn't didn't trend that way, but uh, it was more in accord with yours. But uh, I've I felt like it in this poem she became nature itself mm -hmm. and i saw some a guy talking about being in nature the other day and he was at, at that moment really out in nature and this beautiful open landscape in scotland and he said when you're really out in nature there's no room for thoughts and I think that's true. I mean, it's not that you don't have any thoughts, but it's a whole different thing because the natural world is so full of life, the divine presence manifest as nature, not as human stuff, you know, Yes. that it really, it's like this fullness that just absorbs you and you become it, absorbed into it. And there's no distracting thoughts. I think your mind calms down. Yes. Yes, you're, it, it, th that is true. And of course, John O'Donohue, um, Don, O'Donohue or O'Donohue, who uh, remarks on this a great deal. And uh, it was my experience when I used to go to the high desert in California. It was uh, a, such a wonderful place to go because as you said, uh, the, 
the experience just overwhelms all your minor league thoughts. Hmm. Okay, well, we've just about got time to read this next poem. Uh, so, Ayam, would you like to re read the poem, Redeem That Gender? Um, sure, Brother Shankara. Redeem that gender. Living with that guy, how could you have not gone nuts? I bet he even lied, the coward. I know why God comes to this earth as man in hopes of redeeming that gender. God knows he owes us women big time for the way those brutes usually act. Redeem that gender. Living with that guy, how could you have not gone nuts? I bet he even lied, the coward. I know why God comes to this earth as a man, as man, in hopes of redeeming that gender. God knows he owes us women big time for the way those brutes usually act. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember so clearly when Marjorie and I were first married, the first maybe five years of that marriage. I was just clueless, you know. I'd been raised by a father who was clueless, and I was clueless. Oh my God. It's a wonder she didn't just drop me off the end of the pier. So, uh, yeah, I, I really can hear Mirabai here about the way the way men often act. And I think God has succeeded to some extent in, in, in his goal, <laughs> because nowadays the relationships have certainly changed for the better in, in many. Well, yeah, that was very much the influence of the divine feminine, I think, coming into world, the world so powerfully in the middle of the 19th century and living with us until 1920. Anything else from anyone about this particular poem? Do you think that women have like specific spiritual abilities that men aren't capable of? I mean, I would certainly say so. Well, I'll let the women speak to that i uh, the uh... i i don't think so i think um men carry a heavy burden because they're supposed to be uh manly whatever that means. Yes. And, and that's, that's a terrible burden to carry. Yes, it means basically to be unemotional, to not, yes. to not have any uh, connection, strong connection to your emotions. Right. Big boys don't cry. Now, we, we are making gains, I think, but 
um, a lot of that still remains. Oh, yes. Now, in one of the scriptures from India, there is this particular pair of verses that are interesting. It says, all mythologies and scriptures are your aspects, O goddess. So are all women in the world with their various attributes. So to answer Aaron's question from that perspective, women clearly are especially favored with the ability to bring forth new life. And that is a very special thing indeed, that they actually carry a child if it's a, a, a normal birth, they actually carry a child inside them while this morphogenesis goes on uh, from this single-celled creature non-specialized to this incredibly specialized group of cells that slowly and slowly over nine months period become the human being that is to be born. So at least they have this very great opportunity of being a sacred vessel for new life. It doesn't mean there are not children born who are have not been so favored. But just speaking personally, Aaron, I think that the answer to your question is yes. But it isn't that I disagree with June either. Uh, men in this culture and cultures around the world. I mean, there's a strong argument to be made that there have been 200,000 years of patriarchy. That's a, that's a lot of confinement. <laughs> For the for the masculine. So, dear ones, it's a little after nine o'clock. Um, we won't meet in August. Uh, all of the discussion groups and classes and talks are suspended for the month of August. So we'll meet the first Monday in September, which I don't know what the date of that is, but I'm sure all of us can find it out easily enough. It's the sec, oh, never mind. I think it's the sixth. The sixth, the sixth. Mm -hmm. uh, day, I think. September, okay. So the sixth of September will be our first meeting again. Uh, to, I need the break. I very much need the break. Uh, I'm, yeah, I need the break. Let's just leave it at that. And so, though I will miss you, uh, there is that saying absence makes the heart grow fonder. So we should our hearts and prayers go with you Shankar. thank you dear well i'm not going anywhere uh, i'm i'll be here at the monastery i have no plans to go anywhere some people have made some noises about day trips and things like that yeah. and uh, all that uh, is uh, is is an interesting possibility 
but I'm not going, I'm not going back to California or anywhere else that I know of. So it'll just be in monastic life. There is a saying, a change is as good as a vacation. <laughs> and so this will be a change. Any other final thoughts from anyone? Thank you, Brother Shankar, and thanks for everyone who is here. All right, well. Thank you. This monastery is located near a fire station. So I, I don't know if you heard the sirens go by. It, it, it was here, in Decatur. Well, I thought uh, it was there in Decatur because usually if it's up at the center, I hear it at my house, whatever is going on, because I'm less than half a mile. No, here comes the fire truck. It, it, it's it's here too. If there's something there, there's maybe there's a, a multiple alarm. I don't hear it though. Emergency. Well, here it comes. There we go. Uh, all right, dears. Well, loving prayers. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be cheerful. May you have peace of mind. May you go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So until we meet again, uh, some of you, of course, I'll see during the week for uh, the rest of our classes for this, for August, I mean, for July. Otherwise, those of you that we see only on Monday night, we'll see you on September 6th. Anything else from anyone? Good night, dears. Thank you so Good much. Night. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Joe. Good night. Good night. Good night, all.